a little bit. So maybe I'll make us maybe I'll make a start. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us across many different time zones. I hear. Uh, my name is Pete Millwood. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Society of Fellows in the Humanities here at the University of Hong Kong, where I'm also affiliated at the History Department. Uh, the running order for this event is that in a moment I'll introduce our four speakers, and then Dr. Hamilton will introduce his book uh, that uh, I've really enjoyed reading over the last week, and he'll speak for about 15 minutes to introduce the book, and then each of our three commentators will speak for perhaps about 10 minutes, and then we'll have full audience Q&A. Uh, before I do the introductions, Dr. Hamilton has also very kindly shared a discount code. So if anyone is interested enough in the talk to, to go out and buy the book, I would recommend that you do so. Um, you can use the code CUP20, is that right, Peter? Yes. For a 20% discount off the Columbia uh, University Press website, and I'll add that to the chat as well. Oh, in terms of Q&A, actually, maybe I'll say now, um, we'll have the, the Q&A after about 45 minutes, uh, general audience Q&A. You can either ask questions by mm. writing them in the chat, and you're welcome to do so while any of us are, are speaking before, before then, or once we get to that stage, you can also raise your hand or write in the chat that you have a question, and I'll call on you to unmute and uh, maybe turn your video on if you'd like. We are recording the event so if you'd like to ask a question anonymously, you can send me a message and state that you would like your question to be asked without attribution. So uh, in terms of introductions, Peter Hamilton is the Assistant Professor in Modern Chinese History at Trinity College Dublin. He was previously a postdoctoral fellow at Tsinghua University Schwarzman College, at Columbia University's Weatherhead East Asia Institute, and at UT Austin's Institute for Historical Studies. We have three commentators, uh, in the order in which they'll speak. John Carroll is Professor of History and Associate Dean of the Faculty of Arts here at the University of Hong Kong, where he teaches courses on Hong Kong history, British imperial history, and museums and history. Raised and educated in Hong Kong, Professor Carroll has also taught at the University of Texas at Austin, the College of William and Mary, and St. Louis, Louis University. John Wong is an Associate Professor here at, also at Hong Kong U, with a joint appointment between the Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences and the School of Modern Languages and Cultures. His research focuses on the flow of people, goods, capital, and ideas with a particular interest in Hong Kong and the Pearl River de Delta. And he explores in his research how such flow connected the region to the Chinese political center in the North, as well as China's maritime partners in the South China Sea and beyond. And last but not least, Professor Elizabeth Sin is Honorary Professor in the Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences, also here at HKU. She was likewise born and educated in Hong Kong, same as Professor Carroll, and Professor Sin is an historian with a general research interest in modern China and Hong Kong, and a special interest in the history of charity, business, culture, the press, and migration. Before retiring in 2004, she was the Deputy Director of the Center of Asian Studies here and a member of the university's university research committee. So a very distinguished panel we have today to discuss Peter's book. But first and foremost, um, I'll let him, introduce, let him introduce the book. Over to you, Peter. Good morning from Dublin. Um, thank you all so much for coming out. It really is gratifying and humbling. Let's start with sharing the screen. Um, to see so many old friends and colleagues in the audience. Um, and I'm, I'm particularly grateful to Elizabeth Sin, John Carroll, and John Wong for speaking today, and to Pete Millwood and the HKU Society of Fellows for organizing this event. This book has been a long process, and so it's humbling and gratifying to have it debut in such esteemed company. So Made in Hong Kong re-examines Hong Kong as a keynote in the post-war US-led expansion of global capitalism and the revival of Sino-US trade since the 1971. And in so doing, this project seeks to shift the conversation around Hong Kong's economic development from limiting frameworks of a small British colony, an East Asian tiger, or an East Asian miracle. Instead, utilizing Chinese and English language sources from Hong Kong, mainland China, Britain, and the United States, I examine Hong Kong in overlooked trans-Pacific contexts and foreground its residents' agency in the commercial integration that has remade China and the US since the 1970s. 
Until recently, modern China scholars largely overlooked Hong Kong, considering it small and marginal to national narratives. Yet over the past 15 years, a wave of new scholarship has resituated colonial Hong Kong as an interstitial node in global networks and overlapping empires. From Elizabeth's work, highlighting how the, trans the Trans-Pacific transformation of Hong Kong after the California Gold Rush, to John's demonstration of how the colony's pre-war elites straddled multiple worlds. In turn, new Cold War scholarship has shown how Hong Kong became a key site after 1949 between colliding agendas from London, Beijing, Washington, and Taipei. Yet when I began digging into the, this period through local archives, such as the Public Records Office, HKU's Special Collections, and the Hong Kong Heritage Project, what I found was an untold part of this Cold War story. I found numerous local Chinese elites in the 1950s and 1960s collaborating with expanding US systems in Hong Kong and connecting themselves with the United States for their own agendas, most especially in education and business. So through these sources, I came to see the overlooked agency and influence of very particular Hong Kong people over British imperial decline, US imperial expansion in Asia, and capitalist globalization. Ooh, how do I switch slides? Yeah. As a result, in this book, I home in on an overlooked cohort of mobile, pragmatic, and adaptive Hong Kong elites who fled to Hong Kong during China's communist revolution. Scholars such as Wang Xiu Lun have highlighted the key role of Shanghainese emigres, such as Tang Pingyuan, pictured here, in Hong Kong's industrialization. But I expand this research in two key ways. First, previous scholars have largely overlooked this demographic's extensive existing connections with the United States. And second, I look beyond the Shanghainese cotton spinners and show that an interconnected network of largely US educated Shanghainese and Cantonese bankers, academics, nationalist technocrats, and other professionals all came to Hong Kong with similar backgrounds and agendas. In particular, due to their families, careers, and educations over the Republican era, many of these Shanghainese and Cantonese emigres to Hong Kong retained trans-Pacific networks and bicultural skills that they had acquired through educations in American missionary colleges, US higher education, and or through the wartime Sino-American alliance. These networks and skills gave them inside knowledge of the new US-led capitalist system and the privileged social capital need to access it. As a result, to survive transplantation to Hong Kong, from the mid-1950s, they adapted their strategies to the new US-led order by building new careers and businesses focused on trans-Pacific circulations and Hong Kong's increasing integration with the US. I call these strategies Kwashang strategies, a term meaning straddling merchants and meant to convey a retailering of older Kwashang strategies of imperial collaboration to now suit working with the new US hegemon. These Kwashang strategies of collaborating with US imperial expansion accumulated not just wealth, but also new forms of social capital and economic power that operated on different planes than the nation states coalescing elsewhere in the so-called third world. Rather than self-determination, these emigres pursued what I call informal decolonization in Hong Kong gradually reorienting this crown colony away from British imperial systems and seizing positions once reserved for the overlords. In turn, they transmitted this elite social capital across generations by dispatching their children to US higher education and sponsoring other Hong Kong residents to do the same by collaborating with US Cold War educational projects in Hong Kong. These activities enabled Hong Kong's trans-Pacific commercial and educational circulations to balloon in scale over the 1960s. So by 1973, Hong Kong was both the world's largest exporter of textiles and apparel to the US market and the world's largest sender of foreign students to US higher education. And these trans-Pacific circulations, I argue, positioned this territory to play a decisive role in China's reintegration into global capitalism from the reopening of Sino-US trade in 1971. With limited time, I want to highlight just a few key examples from the book that help illustrate and flesh out these arguments. As I lay out in chapter one, while Hong Kong's established Cantonese elites had long favored British educations, 
the more US-oriented emigres brought new links to American power that engendered new possibilities on the ground. For one, interracial marriage had generally led to social death in Hong Kong in the 1930s. But in 1946, the future head of Citibank in Asia, Henry Sperry, married into the colony's Cantonese establishment by wedding Li Hai San's daughter, Ansi. Their wedding in Shanghai put the Sperrys at the intersection of US and nationalist elites, while Ansi was also given priority to naturalize as a US citizen. After they fled Hong Kong, fled to Hong Kong, she strategically used her new American status to break previously firm colonial glass ceilings by becoming the first Chinese member of numerous white only clubs. Not just an illustration of her personal privilege, Ansi's actions were an early Kwashang strategy to tap into the power of the United States for personal advantage and a first step in informal decolonization as individuals on the ground like her began to rework racial codes in the post-war colony as power shifted from the British Empire to the United States. In turn, as I discuss in chapters two and three, the emigres also included a host of elite Chinese Christians, US educated Chinese academics, and numerous American missionaries. And here's where the Cold War context and collaboration with US state agendas really matter. Previous scholars have highlighted how the colonial regime restricted overt American propaganda in Hong Kong. Scholars have overlooked how US cultural diplomacy evolved in response by beginning to channel millions of dollars through a state private network into these missionary bodies and other NGOs. And this steroid engendered a whole infrastructure of US backed Chinese run Christian affiliated schools, churches, community centers and other institutions across Hong Kong. These behind the scenes US resources and agendas were particularly evident and contentious in higher education. For example, the last president of Lingnan University on the mainland, Wai'a Liying Lam, had attended Oberlin on a YMCA scholarship. Alongside his academic career, he served in the US funded post war reconstruction efforts under Jiang Tingfu, a fellow Oberlin alum. And such prestigious positions gave Lee high level contacts in the US government. When he came to Hong Kong in 1951, Lee became one of the CIA backed Committee for Free Asia's quote, earliest contacts in Hong Kong. It was also Lee's contacts in New York that secured the first US $20,000 grant for Chung Chi College through the Lingnan trustees. Working alongside board chairman David Au, Lee's tenure established a heavily American oriented college that gave colonial officials considerable anxiety. And such tensions only grew as the Chinese university project coalesced under its first vice chancellor, Dr. Li Chongming. As I discussed in chapter four, Vice Chancellor Li was another American returned student who had worked at high levels of the nationalist government before becoming a Berkeley based US citizen, economist and US citizen. As vice chancellor, Li was perhaps the most decisive Kwashang actor by building CUHK into what I call a Trans-Pacific University. From the US State Department donating its first building, the Benjamin Franklin Center, to recruiting American funding for a panoply of exchange programs and US model degree programs, including an MBA program. And while Lee always framed all of these activities as international in nature, in reality, through files at Stuart Stanford's Hoover Institute, I show that throughout his tenure, Lee was secretly paid a supplemental salary by the now rebranded Asia Foundation, which means he was in the pay of a proxy of the US government. Thus, both Waya Lee and Li Chongming illustrate how these emigres networks and strategies advanced their personal interests, co-opted Cold War US agendas in Hong Kong, and accelerated Hong Kong's trans-specific educational reorientation. And these educational shifts mirrored and accelerated parallel shifts in Hong Kong's economic development. While previous scholars have continued to emphasize British firms such as the Hong Kong Bank, Jardine Matheson or Swire, I highlight that in reality, the United States became Hong Kong's largest export market in 1959 and its largest outside investor by 1963. In chapter five, I dig into the figures and processes behind these shifts. As one example, the Dartmouth alum H.J. Shen 
had been a top official at the Central Bank of China before 1949. After fleeing to Hong Kong, Shen became a key broker between the emigre industrialists and the Hong Kong Bank. His brokering enabled him in 1964 to become the bank's first Chinese manager, again advancing informal decolonization and shifting how we see such colonial institutions. Simultaneously, as seen here, Shen was regularly traveling to the United States to visit his family in San Francisco, to recruit trade and, trade and investment, to negotiate in Washington against US protectionism, and to forge personal connections with universities like Yale. And while I won't go into too much detail for everyone, I show how similar figures and relationships were instrumental in a host of other US multinational investments into Hong Kong in the 1960s, including Mobile Oil's construction of Meifu San Chuan, which literally means the Mobile Oil New Village. Chapter six then demonstrates how these trans-Pacific relationships reshape our understanding of Hong Kong's rapid economic growth over the 1970s. Between 1970 and 1980, Hong Kong's GDP per capita increased by 600%, carrying it from the so-called third world to the first. In place of East Asian miracles or little tiger narratives, I highlight that by the 1970s, all these trans-Pacific connections had positioned particular Hong Kong firms to benefit dramatically from this decade's tumultuous global economic shifts, most especially the shift toward post-Fordist production. A great example here is again the Tang family of South Sea textiles. Eldest son Jack's education at MIT and Harvard Business School gave the family networks that they used very actively for marketing and even to secure lucrative Pentagon contracts. In turn, Jack's American education cued him in early to the American denim craze, leading to his father to sign a transformative joint venture with Levi's in 1964. These adaptations positioned South Sea textiles to move up market by beginning to outsource production, lower cost production in the early 1970s, but eventually to fire all of its Hong Kong workers, sell off the land to Lee Kush and sell off the land to Lee Kashing for in Jack's own words, quote, more money than all the profits added up together from 1949. So those trans-Pacific educational circulations helped to position specific Hong Kong firms to continuously adapt within US-led global capitalism and reap the rewards of the globalizing 1970s. Finally, and you'll, you'll have to read the book to get all the details, but in chapter seven and eight, I demonstrate why we need this trans-Pacific this trans history to understand Hong Kong's particular role in China's export-driven development from the sourcing conglomerates of Li and Fang and Esquel to the real estate developer Hopewell Holdings. I show how these same multi-generational Kwashiung strategies and trans-Pacific networks expanded into the PRC from the early 1970s, gradually connecting the mainland's low-cost labor with these companies' established US cl clients and investors. In turn, as seen here, figures such as Jack Tang also played instrumental roles in the informal handover negotiations and the verbal agreements that really defined one country, two systems, leading them to gradually rebalance their Kwashiung strategies between China and the United States. So in short, in Made in Hong Kong, I argue that Hong Kong's post-war trans-Pacific networks and histories tell a new story of its economic evolution, as well as of China's reemergence and today's Sino-US trading relationship. Through these emigres and their multi-generational strategies, we see not just that capitalism survived on the PRC's doorstep, but more specifically that key continuities in families, companies, and systems of inherited privilege survived across the 1949 rupture, intermingled with global actors and processes in this Cold War colony, and then came back from the mid-1970s to broker China's reintegration into global capitalism. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for that excellent introduction to this very interesting book. Uh, I think we're going to hand over to Professor John Carroll now, if uh, if his internet is holding up okay. Um, my internet is holding up okay. Uh, can you hear me okay, Pete? Yeah, that's right. I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, what What is not working, unfortunately, is my, my camera suddenly. I've lost Wi-Fi 
and I switched to my phone and that's uh, the, the camera doesn't seem to be working. So I think maybe I will just uh, just use the audio function here, if that's cool. okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Peter and Pete. Um, I have to say that I'm probably the most fortunate person in, in this event because I've had the pleasure of reading Made in Hong Kong twice. Once in dissertation form under a slightly different title uh, as a member of Peter's dissertation committee at the University of Texas. Uh, and now, of course, I've been able to read it in book form for this wonderful event organized by Pete Millwood. I've not only had the pleasure of reading Made in Hong Kong twice, I've had the pleasure of seeing it go from thesis to book, which is kind of like sitting down with old friends who have gotten even better over time and older, of course, uh, but who've also brought along a few new friends to liven things up. Uh, except, of course, this is a much more complicated process than hanging out with friends, uh, at least for the, the author who has to go from the thesis to the book. My only regret is that we couldn't all celebrate together in person, uh, but such the nature of these pandemic days. On the brighter side, most of us would not even be here together at all today if it were not for these pandemic days, uh, which thanks to Zoom and the like have uh, helped us share new ideas and findings in remarkable ways. What I wanna do is uh, just to make a few comments about Peter's book and then perhaps uh, preempt the Q&A. I see there are a lot of participants here, about a hundred, more than a hundred. So I think there'll be a lot of questions. So I'll just preempt the Q&A a bit by asking a few of my own questions as I go along. Uh, as I mentioned before, I was getting the dreaded your internet connection is unstable warning. So uh, I've switched to the phone, but I, I do apologize if I fade in and out just a bit. So first of all, it's always great to see more scholars taking Hong Kong seriously. Um, as a place in its own right, but also as a place that both shapes and is shaped by other places. Uh, and Peter puts it very nicely in his introduction when he says, by putting Hong Kong at the center, we recover both its unique historical experience and an overlapping set of global histories that radiate outward from this node. And then later on, he says that uh, these trans-Pacific circulations and networks that uh, linked Hong Kong with the US during the Cold War show how small places, in quotes, by the way, small places can capitalize on the power and markets of, again, quote, large imperial states. Uh, and then he reminds us uh, uh, that despite living in a small colony through 1997, Hong Kong people have been leading actors in the development and evolution of both Chinese and global capitalism. And most importantly, I think, is uh, the fact that Peter does this with examples of the many, people involved in these uh, living, breathing humans, some of them who are in fact still living and breathing. <laughs> Peter starts his book with a point that has confounded many people who work on Hong Kong. For despite this rags to riches story of the Hong Kong miracle, uh, historians have paid very little attention to Hong Kong's economic transformation. Instead, they speak in generalizations, abstractions, cliches. You know what I'm talking about, free port this, free port that. Uh, the importance of hard work, which supposedly no one has anymore, uh, the accidental nature of Hong Kong history, and so on. Anytime somebody asks me to come up or recommend a good economic history of Hong Kong, I almost always draw a blank, which, which seems very strange. Uh, Peter's story shows plenty of riches, not so many rags, uh, because yes, these elite emigres lost most of their physical property after 1949, but they didn't lose everything. And as Peter points out, because of their families, their careers, their educations, they kept this inside knowledge of the US-led capitalist system and the privileged social capital that was needed to access it. And I think, uh, in other words, this was not such a miracle. Hong Kong's story cannot necessarily be replicated, nor should it be replicated, because he points out that it was not a process that it benefited everyone. In fact, it was a process that was made possible by inequality and unfairness, in turn promoting inequality and unfairness. And as Peter puts it so eloquently, quote, it was contingent, unsustainable, and grossly unfair. Peter has also coined two new terms, both of which I think will discuss, will generate a lot of discussion and debate, uh, both here and sort of in, in, in the fields in general. One, of course, is Kwa Shang, the straddling merchants. Uh, although I do wonder what these merch, these people themselves, Peter, would think about the term you've devised for them. And I also wonder what their children would think of the term, especially as we have now a new even competing groups of Kwa Shang and their children in Hong Kong. These, of course, would be the people who've come in in recent years from the mainland, uh, which is a very different mainland from the ones when your Kwa Shang came in. Uh, but you've also coined the term informal decolonization, uh, an extension perhaps of the term informal empire. And by the way, your book 
um, really discusses informality at all kinds of different levels, just as it discusses empire and decolonization in so many different ways. Um, in any case, Quashong uh, enables Peter to straddle, if you pardon the pun, several different fields, uh, Chinese history, overseas Chinese history, British imperial history, American imperial history, business history as well. And I'm not sure everyone, anyone else has been able to do this so well, at least for the, uh, for the, for the post-war period. And what's notable, I think, or so notable about the Kwashiung, the straddling merchants, is um, first of all, how they're not all merchants, right? Uh, some of them are bankers, industrialists, executives, academics, technocrats, people, by the way, I would have been happy to call the bourgeoisie, though it's not a term that Peter uses, uh, except for once, once in the book, thanks to the PDF function. I could find that. Uh, but what is so noticeable about, I think, is uh, how much they straddle or how much they qua. Right, the communist transition in the 40s, the mainland Hong Kong transition during the same period, Sino-American relations, connections, interactions, and there are only a few examples here. What of course ties these together, Kwashiung uh, and informal decolonization is the, uh, the decline and the rise of China, the decline of the British Empire, and then American expansion in the Western Pacific. Peter also suggests a few reasons why so few Hong Kong people know about these Kwashiung. One, he argues, is that local history is not taught in schools, which is slightly a little more complicated than that, I think, but maybe we can talk about that later on in the Q&A. Uh, but I think he's made a very good point that, uh, I mean, what's really interesting to me is how many people in Hong Kong do actually know a Kwashiung family or know somebody who's married into a Kwashiung family. But uh, I wonder, for example, how many colleagues or students at Chinese U or Baptist U actually really think about the American roots of their universities. Um, speaking of America, a few scholars I think have shown the role of Americans loosely defined in Hong Kong history as well as Peter has. One notable exception being our, our colleague, Stacy Ford, who has done something like that in her wonderful book, Troubling American Women. But like Stacy, Peter has expanded and, uh, and complicated the notion of being American in Hong Kong. And he's done so ethnically, nationally, and culturally. He talks about this idea of being artificially naturalized, which includes, for example, going to universities in the US and many other kinds of American social capital. In this vein, Peter has also rewritten higher education into the history of Hong Kong uh, in ways that few scholars have, at least for the post-war period. Uh, one exception being our own Peter Kunick, who has done so in his, uh, his work on Hong Kong U. Now, I'm well aware that John and Peter are popular names this evening, <laughs> and that we are going to have at least one more John to share his comments. So I'm gonna just stop here now and turn things over to John Wong. Congratulations and thank you, Peter Hamilton, for providing the occasion for this event. Thank you, Pete Millwood, for organizing everything. And thanks to everyone else for participating. Thanks, John, uh, for, those, for those very insightful comments. And as you say, we'll, we'll hand over to Dr. John Wong now um, for further commentary. Thanks, Pete. Well, few would dispute that Hong Kong prospered as a global hub in the Cold War Yet seldom do we focus on this British colony at the doorsteps of mainland China as a linchpin of Sino-American connections, of course, with the notable exception of Elizabeth Sin's work, Pacific Crossing. Uh, Peter Hamilton, focusing on the later period, reminds us of the critical function the city served in fashioning trans-Pacific networks against the backdrop of the global dynamics during the Cold War. So this is not a book just about Hong Kong, it's about the, the uh, weaving together of a global network um, in this later period in which Hong Kong served as an important nexus. Peter has done a great job um, teasing you with many of the colorful stories um, that you'll see in the book, so do buy a copy. And instead of getting more into the content of the work, I would um, like to highlight a couple of um, questions or issues that I'd like us to consider um, because I feel that that's important to that period and also to our contemporary situation. And those two items I'd like to uh, highlight for our consideration would be the role of the U.S. and education. The role of the U.S. in Hong Kong's development was, is unmistakable in uh, Peter's work. It should be understandable that the city's residents, past or present and here in Hong Kong, seem oblivious to backroom politics and businesses that involve to the U.S. But on second thought, does it have to be? Peter showed you a map of Hong Kong, um, the distribution of the US-inspired or US-led educational institu institutions. I would 
direct your attention to maybe a smaller area, a smaller but crucial area. If you were to zoom in um, on your Google map or whatever device you, you like to, or program you like to use um, to the central district of Hong Kong, and imagine a triangle that starts uphill from the government house, uh, where we know Carrie Lam apparently is piling a lot of cash in, uh, in her office or in her residence, extend it down to the bottom of the hill, the base of the hill, where money really is, HSBC, and in, the, in this environment, maybe extended to Bank of China. Think of this triangle. That is really the brain of Hong Kong, certainly colonial Hong Kong. Within this triangle, you see all the government offices. All the offices were there before many of them moved down the hill towards the, uh, the harbor front. Uh, but now the old offices are still housing such important institutions as our Department of Justice. Smacked in the middle of that, what do you see? The US Consulate General that moved there in the mid 50s or the late 50s. Before that, it was scattered at a bunch of locations, uh, among which was, uh, I guess, an office in the HSBC building. And just in case you think that's the only important US function on basically the government hill, move down the hill to the base across from the HSBC, HSBC building, where Lee ka is now holding court. That is the site of the Hilton Hotel, the grand dam of the US hotel chain. And just in case we don't understand how important that was, moved next door from the Hilton. That was the old Beaconsfield house, which was home to the government information services department. So it's not tough to imagine if you were to go back to the period, actually I, you know, I did live in some of those years, that was a center of information and espionage. Both of the institutions at the bottom of the hill um, came into being in 1963 both of them basically went out in 1995 to make room for Li ka -shing. So if we were to think about it that way, we have inscribed in the spatial configuration of the most important districts of Hong Kong, well, maybe one of the most now, um, hiding in plain sight evidence of US primary role in the development of this city in the crucial year of its transformations. Yet the US was conspicuously absent as critical junctures um, such as the Sino-British negotiations over the future of Hong Kong, even though unwavering US sponsorship was arguably more vital to Hong Kong's prosperity than extended British participation. Peter reminds us that Britain provided a special partner whose continued rule of Hong Kong served as a convenient placeholder beneath which Kwa Shang strategies of collaboration with US imperial system could thrive. My question is, how uniquely oblique and opaque was US participation in this Cold War frontier of Hong Kong during successive rounds of geopolitical shifts? This, is, this was no 17th parallel, no 38th parallel. How should we view the case of Hong Kong? Is it indicative of the desirability of a more covert approach of US involvement in global politics? Now switching over to the second item that I would like us to consider, education. Critical to Hong Kong's phenomenal success was Kwa Shang's program um, with which they constructed US connections, especially through higher education. Peter calls education a means to acquire cross-cultural social capital that could reliably con be converted into economic capital. Perhaps this impact was the most noticeable when a well-positioned family undertakes this endeavor through multiple generations. Perhaps if we were to make it more of a global story, it could be more fruitful to situate these US connections alongside enduring Hong Kong interest in grooming UK style gentlemanly capitalists at Oxford and Cambridge. You saw a little bit of a glimpse of uh, the fascinating stories about the, um, the various universities uh, with US involvement and the establishment of CUHK points to perhaps a widening opportunity of upward mobility to the, Hong the average Hong Kong resident. Yet the cultivation of social capital seemed to have remained largely the prerogative of the upper crust. So rising economic ties lifted the living standards across the board in Hong Kong, but were the masses in Hong Kong simply marching to the drumbeat of the city's historical change engineered by scheming elites? The lessons from this book remains instructive today as Hong Kong needs to chart a new course forward in the world, in a world in which the PLC 
continues to ascend and uh, the US continues to dominate. The adroit operation of the movers and shakers in Hong Kong pivoted the city away from a waning empire to the US led system in the Cold War. In the closing years of colonial Hong Kong, the various parties sidestepped what appeared impossible hurdles, in particular June 4th, and orchestrated a relatively seamless transition in 1999 by deploying Kwashiang resources, uh, the, among, but the most important of which was the networks of the Dong family, from which hailed our first chief executive. As I was reading um, Peter's account, I couldn't help but think about the Tang family, which appeared time and again, um, in, in the book and also in the slides that you saw, what if Henry Tang? Or if you were to not look at the Tang family, think about John Zhang, more humble background, but US, education, US educated nonetheless. Going forward, could Hong Kong continue, continue to account on such state private networks, especially along a Sino-US axis for sustained economic growth? Or has the accrual of benefits to the select few because of the injustices uh, that you, you mentioned in the book and John has highlighted, so strain the system that this political economic configuration has lost its efficacy. It is important for all of us to read the book, not just to inform our understanding of Hong Kong's development, but also to inspire us to think about a pathway for the city going forward. So everyone go buy the book and Peter, congratulations. Thanks, John. Uh, for, for those for those very lively comments. Um, Elizabeth, over to you now for the final comment. Um, from time to time, I read a good book and wish I had written it. Peter's book is definitely one of those books. It's well-researched, insightful, and imaginative. I had a great time reading it twice, actually, also. But I also wish I had written it because of how much it resonates with me. To Peter the historian, Hong Kong in the 40s, 50s, and 60s are the objects of his research. He uses a huge array of materials, archives, and oral histories to construct that past, and very successfully demonstrates the creation of Hong Kong's trans-Pacific educational and commercial circulations that gave rise to deep-rooted US-China relations and US-Hong Kong relations. To me, however, the content of the book is my lived experience and reading it isn't just a scholarly exercise, but very much a walk down memory lane. I was born in Hong Kong in 1948. And I remember the growing presence of Shanghai and the growing presence of America on different levels that Peter describes at the beginning of the book. The first neighbors I can remember were Shang was a Shanghainese family that lived upstairs of us. We moved into this house in 1949 and they had just arrived from Shanghai. And they only spoke Shanghainese and at least for the first, for the next 20 years, they never learned to speak Cantonese properly. My impression then, clearly totally biased, was that they spoke really loud and sounded like they were fighting all the time. Well, maybe they were fighting all the time, but at least at that time, I thought Shanghainese could only be spoken loudly. And the school where I started attending from 1953 the number of Shanghainese students increased and teachers too. I knew that they were Shanghainese because they spoke Cantonese with an accent and they spelled the surnames differently. For a while, my best friend in school was Betty Wang, W-A-N-G, who had just arrived from Shanghai. And she was the, also the first person I knew who anglicized her name Wong as W-A-N-G and not W-O-N-G. I knew lots of Wongs, but she was the first Wang and there were other funny spellings. Santa Ku was actually a quok. Margaret Sui was actually a toe. Anna Ann was actually an on. And Yip became yay. And so there were all these confusions of um, transliteration of names for me. They, they meant a, a very different change in world. And the arrivals from Shanghai in this period were not all Chinese. They were Indians, Jews, Eurasians, and many others. One of my first friends outside the school was Claire, a Jewish girl who had come with her parents from Shanghai. They were brothers, uh, the, the brothers were British Jews, stockbrokers, and they had been tortured by the Japanese. And the most amazing sight that I can remember 
was a team, teams of Russian men with big beards digging roads in Shamshui Po. It's a sight, it's, it's really quite a sight. They were wearing kind of uh, peasant outfits and they were big, huge Russian men. And later many of them emigrated to Australia. Food was another Shanghai presence for me. My father who had spent some years in Shanghai loved Chinese food. And at first we used to go to the same look, the four, five, six restaurant in North Point. But more and more Shanghai restaurants were opened all over Hong Kong Island as, and Tsim Sha Choi in the late 50s and 60s. To the Cantonese population, Shanghai restaurants were, restaurants were quite exoteric. Hong Kong people weren't as adventurous about food as they are now. And also emerging were Nan Po, uh, southern goods shops that sold goods from Shanghai, especially in the, from the Shanghai area. Hairy crabs in autumn and Shaoxing wine in all kinds of Chinese goodies. And there were huge legs of ham hanging from the ceilings of the, of the shops. It took me a long time to figure out why these shops should be called Nan Ho, <clears throat> giving that to us in Hong Kong. Shanghai Chinese people were northerners, were Bei Fang Ren. In fact, for most Hong Kong people, anyone coming from north of Guangdong was a Song Hoya, was a Shanghainese. And strangely enough, the Shanghainese exodus also gave Hong Kong Russian bakeries. And these were often run by Shandong people who had operated Russian bakeries and coffee shops in Shanghai. And so they were Chanticleer and ABC and Libby's and Queens in Wan Chai, which lasted until maybe 10 years ago, where, they could, where we could buy stuffed peppers and different Russian breads and pastries and movies too. And there were Mandarin movies and people coming from Shanghai making movies, the film stars and directors and producers coming from Shanghai who became very active, actively producing movies in Hong Kong and musicians jazz musicians and Filipino bands and um, classical musicians like uh, Liu Pei Yan, uh, the pipa player. And there was Tai De Yuan, the Gu Jing player, whom Professor Bell Young called the last of China's literati. And Bell himself, you know Bell, Bell Young, he himself had come to Hong Kong from Shanghai as a child. And there were writers, lots of writers, and like writers like Jin Yong, Louis Cha, who founded the Ming Bao, who had a big influence on Hong Kong's culture. His martial arts novels were really popular at the time, and I spent a lot of time reading them uh, when I was 11 or 12, and really fixated on them, like kids reading uh, Harry Potter nowadays. Besides Cha, Cha there were uh, writers from the mainland who were also busy publishing. I read and contributed to a journal called the Chinese Students Weekly, and that was also definitely anti-communist. And it was rumored to have close relations with the American government and probably funded by, um, the American, funded by American money. So alongside this new Shanghai presence was American presence. Another of my school friends, Sheila Harmon, her father was in charge of the leprosy colony in Hailing Chow. The USIS had a library where we could go to read magazines. We read a lot of, we saw a lot of Hollywood movies. We clapped when cowboys rode in and killed red Indians. And when US troops rode in to kill Americans, we all clapped too. But looking back, it was a lot of indoctrination. It had always been said that the main bar itself had been funded by American money. And of course, we were also fixated on the Mad Magazine. The US consulate that you mentioned on uh, Garden Road was built. At first, it was quite small with walls that you can actually look over and see the building inside. And that became bigger and bigger and, and until it looks like a fortress now. And a lot of American uh, academics started to fill posts at Hong Kong U and the Chinese U and scholars starting to come to do um, field work. And, American businessmen came to make investments and fashion buyers came to keep an eye on the factories that produced their garments and wigs. And then of course the Hilton Hotel was built. And I remember going there as a, as a child in the late, um, when the, soon after it was built. 
And Amer American military also had a high profile in the form of American sailors in, uh, on r, &R and patronizing bars around Wan Chai and Chimsatsui. So apart from the triangle and central, we also have the, the outpost in Wan Chai and in Chimsatsui. Uh, at first during the Korean War and later during the Vietnam War. So that's my nostalgia, that's the Hong Kong, um, my childhood that Peter's book uh, uh, evoked. And I, I, I really enjoyed reading it because it's so much part of my makeup and also part of Hong Kong's makeup as well. So let's uh, zoom out and look at Peter's book in a larger context. Made in Hong Kong shows many historical processes, the making of networks, the making of globalization at different levels, and of course, the making of Hong Kong itself. Peter reminds us that Hong Kong was and remains a work in progress. He also reminds us of the deep rootedness of many networks and connections crossing several generations, some since the Republican period. And I think this, this is really important to understand what's happening today by looking really far back, right? Not just to, to the 60s or the 70s or, the, or even just to the post-war period. And Peter has given us a very inspiring paradigm. The networks and mechanisms for social and political change he focuses on are formed by important people, Jack Tang, Lee Chuan Ming, Gordon Wu, Victor and William Fong, Margie Tang. They are movers and shakers, but they are not national figures as such. They are under the radar for, st for students of international relations and international trade and who look for national players. So as the Kua Shang, or the Kwa people, are being newly discovered actors, what Peter called, or whom Peter called, the actual people who did real things and made real changes. Their social capital, built on inherited wealth and inherited connections and education, enable them to survive political changes, wars and financial crises, and thrive across borders. I would add that many of the people you mentioned also succeeded because of their own hard work and intelligence. They are really the elites in many ways. And I'm saying this because there are many families that went under because they have lazy sons, lazy, useless sons. So the, the, there is a certain sort of built in um, historical context, but the individual achievements are also really important. And this kind of transnational social studies is exciting. It can, in, 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 times of, in terms of paradigm, it's not just migration studies. It's not just diaspora studies. Sociological studies are mostly confined within regional and national borders. And they do not explore the phenomena on a transnational scale, a transnational level, or a transnational scope. And Peter's book is exploring it at a previously neglected level that should be applied more often to understand the world. It is almost mind boggling to read about the pervasiveness of American connections in Hong Kong since 1949, both on the radar and under the radar. This makes the book more relevant now in 2021 than ever before. That's it. Thanks, uh, thanks Elizabeth, um, for a uh, final set of excellent and very interesting and stimulating comments. Uh, uh, maybe, before we open out to the q and I, I might add one or two of my own and then give Peter a chance uh, to respond to, to some of those comments if, he, if he'd like to. Um, but just to say, you're very welcome, as I, as I wrote in the chat, to either write your questions on the chat or alternatively to raise your hand through the, the raise hand function on Zoom. I probably won't catch it if it's just to your camera or to send a message on the chat to say that you'd like to ask the question through the microphone and through the video. But, uh, but first, maybe just, just a couple of questions of my own. I mean, I, this commentary has already been very stimulating, I think. Um, Peter, I wondered to what extent, well, I mean, the, the book is in many ways, I think one of the many interesting aspects of it is how there's this sort of epilogue to the earlier period in US-China relations and to American efforts to influence education and business in China before 1949. And this is asking you to simplify a major theme of the book, but I wondered to what extent you think the links explored in the book are the result of American and Chinese initiatives before 1949 that then play out in Hong Kong and are facilitated by that space, but that don't originate there. 
And secondly, and perhaps slightly unfairly, given that the book is explicitly on Hong Kong and not on elsewhere, I wondered how specific to Hong Kong you felt that the phenomenon that you're describing is, or the phenomena that you're describing are. Are the social and commercial choices you highlight particular to Hong Kong and to this Kwa Shang, um, group or character of the Kwa Shang, or is this a phenomenon that you describe, the phenomenon that you describe primarily, in fact, the shadow cast by two rising powers by the United States and then by the PRC in the context of British imperial decline? To put it more succinctly, how active do you think Hong Kong actors are in the processes that you describe and, and how reactive do you think they are? Many questions are, are coming in, but uh, maybe Peter, if you wanted to respond to, to the commentary to what's already been discussed first, and, and then we'll uh, hand over to the, to the audience. Thank you so much for all of those amazing comments and stories and, and wonderful compliments. I'm really very honored. Um, Pete, I, I think I'll start with your questions, I, uh, and they relate, I think, to things, other things that were brought up. Um, of that, how to what extent um, were these links and, and these connections with the United States from before 1949? And I, that's particularly, I think, what struck me throughout this was the ways in which old things could be repurposed, you know, after 1949. And for some of these people, they were all the Tang family is somewhat extreme in this sense that they had already really attached themselves in various ways to the US before 1949. But throughout showing how different other kinds of links between American Missionary College alumni associations, you know, and that sometimes these alumni associations, in the case of David Al, they receive the outreach from the US government who realizes that they may be amenable, uh, they may be uh, like minded in, in certain interests and projects. Um, and so there's all these kinds of old old baggages and old p things that are dusted off and repurposed in a very Hong Kong way um, and made new and kind of combined with new things, resources most especially in the 1950s and 1960s and blossom, you know. Um, the, the question of how specific this is to Hong Kong I think is a really tough one to answer and I hope that there will be more scholarship that you know, refines, debates, disputes, adds to complements this, particularly in other contexts. Um, because on one level, logic tells us that it shouldn't be that unique um, and that there were many forms of US international outreach. You know, Europe is a great example, Cult Congress for Cultural Freedom, Fulbright programs, et cetera, as the world over. But that said, simultaneously, Hong Kong was very unique at this time in ways that we have forgotten because things as a non-national space, as, as not really a state at all, um, things were possible in Hong Kong in the 1950s and 1960s that were just not possible elsewhere. Um, but part of the reason that I, I don't think that uh, comparisons with places like Taiwan and Singapore are that helpful at this time period because both of them were um, US aligned, a quite firm, militaristic dictatorships, um, you know, and that in Hong Kong, one could legally hold multiple passports from that time period forward, which you couldn't do in the US or the UK either. One could freely trade currencies across the Bretton Woods, you know, the supposedly fixed rates of the Bretton Woods system, Hong Kong was a whole in that system and in the Sterling area. Um, and so there are all these kinds of strategies that are possible in ways in which people can hook themselves up to these US agendas, these systems that, that at the very least would have been much more dangerous in many other contexts, much more fraught at the very least in other contexts for a local person, say the head of the university <clears throat> to be receiving a supplemental salary channeled through the CIA, through the Asia Foundation, you know, that, that, that uh, and the colonial government knew about Li Chomeng being paid that. Um, so there's, there's this unique context combined with what's happening globally. And, and there's more, there's much more, I think, to say and find out about this and, and these comparisons. Um, yeah, and, and just to, uh, to go to, to John's excellent questions as well, um, kind of already answered the, the part of that question, I think, but um, 
In terms of education, I think part of what really startled me or helped clarify a lot of this to me, I think is a better way to put it, um, was that often the, the students who particularly through a portal like CUHK or the colleges that preceded it, that went to the US, I don't think they were uninterested in going to higher education in Britain, to Oxford or Cambridge, if it had been available. It just wasn't available. Um, and that, you know, there were just far fewer resources available to go to higher education in the United Kingdom. Um, and in particular, I think it's in chapter three, talk about this in the, is particularly evident in the, the government's scholarship and bursary files. Um, and that, you know, these are just government handed out grants and, and various forms of scholarships. And sometimes students leave those scholarship programs to go overseas. No one ever goes, leaves those programs in the records at least that I've seen to go to an opportunity in the United Kingdom. They go to Australia, they go to Canada, most of all the US, but none of them ever leave to go to an opportunity in the UK. And I don't think that that's because they wouldn't have loved to. Um, it's just, it, it wasn't available as much. And that in that sense, the way that the flows of money really matter in providing opportunity and kind of a structured set of opportunities that at this time, CUHK in particular just made US opportunities much more manifold and, and available for many people, I think. Um, but yes, I, I, I won't drag on, but I, I really am very humbled and, and grateful for these comments and look forward to all the, the audience's questions. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so those, those questions are indeed coming in. Um, so I'll, I'll read out maybe one or two and then uh, give you a chance to respond. And uh, I'm, I'm sure more will come in as well. The first is from Tamwo Jo uh, from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. She wanted to follow up on John's insightful comments, John Mon perhaps, and ask if Peter could respond whether informal decolonization brought more opportunities for upward social mobility for those underprivileged under the British, and also ask what you're working on for your second uh, book, Peter. Um, and the head of the Society of Fellows in the Humanities program um, also has a, has a question. And Giorgio, Giorgio asks that he, well, he says that he's struck by the emphasis on families in this and asks if Peter can say something to the effect of the significance of family relations as a force of historical change and continuity, again, sort of in a broader sense. Maybe I'll give you a chance to respond to those and then there are, there are many more um, ahead. Those are both great questions. Um, the process of informal decolonization that I describe was primarily available to elites who were able and, you know, to kind of go to some of these ineffable qualities that don't necessarily, are hard to find in the archive, uh, but uh, elite and confident people um, such as Anzi Lee Sperry, who felt empowered to march in to the club and demand to become a member of the Hong Kong club, you know, and, and in essence threaten them um, that would they dare deny an American. And I didn't go into this, but it's particularly important that the Lee family had been denied from these clubs previously. So this was a, I'm back now um, with, with, a, with something in hand to change the equation. Um, and that those kinds of um, remarkable moments um, generally are most clear cut um, for these elites becoming the first of this or the first of that. But more broadly, I think that the informal decolonization and particularly through this educational reorientation to the US does provide a much um, broader set of opportunities for upward mobility, um, not to everyone, um, you know, and that the, the vast majority of Hong Kong people had no hope to go to any higher education at all at this time period, but more people, particularly through the CUHK project as the second university and the first university to teach in Chinese four degree programs um, and all of its links. And it actually relates to, to answering George's question about the emphasis on families here, because um, part of the reason for the emphasis on families goes into the, the Kwashang strategies uh, as a concept in that all of this is interrelated with ambitions to migrate. Um, and that throughout the post-1949 period, many such 
people you know, um, uh, desired to go overseas. And that was always the plan. Um, and, and families like the Tangs, um, Li Chuming, et cetera, um, always assumed that eventually Hong Kong would come to an end as they knew it. Um, and that correctly or incorrectly um, from 1949 and even before that, before the Tangs even migrated to Hong Kong, began planning that exodus. Hong Kong was the first stop on a multi-generational journey um, that would likely end somewhere else. Um, and education is particularly instrumental throughout that whole process as both a business strategy for now, but also as a legal step towards migration. Um, and particularly through the, what we call the student side door, the US has never capped student admissions. Um, you know, uh, if you are able to go to higher education in the United States and then work after you jump a huge set, set of hurdles legally to begin the path towards permanent residency. Um, and so even then, it, particularly as the US reforms its immigration policies, um, their education filters into this whole, what we might call transnational escape or exit strategy, should things um, have gone poorly in Hong Kong. Um, and so informal decolonization and Kwashiorkor strategies also play into this multi-generational um, business and mobility strategy um, where each step reinforces or helps out with the larger project. Okay, so there's um, our first anonymous question and that I think it's very good. It's quite a full question. So maybe I'll ask this one by itself. And it's about the experience of the people that you talk about in the book at US universities. What was the sort of day-to-day -day experience of that? Did they live in dormitories? Were they, you know, these are elite people, were they admitted to elite clubs and secret societies? And the speaker, sorry, the, the question asker asked this because international and colonial students often lived in, in separate residences during this period run by the British Council because they faced housing discrimination in post-war London, in the UK example. And as well, this was before the more significant wave of integration of non-white students at elite universities in the United States as well. And finally, were the women in these families, so I think this is a sub-theme actually in, in the book that, that would be great to hear a little bit, um, your, your thoughts on Peter. Are the women in these families educated in the US? What's their experience? And how did their, or did their education in the United States afford them positions of influence when upon graduation? Also all great questions. Um, the experience at US universities varied a lot, but something that I was struck by was how many in various writings, et cetera, at least claimed that they were the only Chinese student or one of the only Chinese students at this college, that university, et cetera, in the 50s and 60s. And for many of them, that's very, very difficult, uh, very isolating, very, um, uh, scary, uh, you know, as a, you know, a young person like any other. Um, but many of them then retroactively credit it with particularly achieving bi bilingual fluency, um, and that their English then became really excellent, um, in part because they were forced to speak nonstop and, uh, at least try to do well in their classes. And many of them did not do that well um, academically, um, in part, you know, because different culture, different, different academic environment than they were used to in Hong Kong, the language difficulties. Um, and so in many ways, it, it's, it kind of sunk in all the more to me how much this experience was very defining and not necessarily predestined for one that they would remember positively, um, but usually do. Um, and that it, it was a much bigger thing than just broadening my personal horizons uh, and instead a much a bigger familial investment project um, and expectations. Um, most downplayed discrimination, that's where, one area where I was particularly skeptical of um, uh, what they had written in memoirs and other kinds of articles and interviews and oral histories. Um, almost universally, they, they they said that they didn't experience discrimination or that that's not what they remember. They remembered welcoming and, you know, which I imagine my, my sense is that that's a, a rosy memory um, edited with time. In the introduction, I say that for the second question about um, 
women in these families that in part it is inadvertently a story about patriarchy um, and that that wasn't the plan. Um, but I think that it is very evident um, throughout many of these, these um, families, uh, the ways in which an older generation actively chooses sons um, and usually older sons um, for this, this, this opportunity. Um, and responsibility. I think it, uh, you know, many of them also complained, you know, Jack Tang is the eldest, Gordon Wu is the eldest, uh, or one of the oldest, um, and that often complained that their siblings were settled in the U.S. in comfortable lives in L.A. and San Francisco while they had to come back and do the work. Um, but the example in terms of, of women that particularly stood out to me is, is the example of Lee Cho Ming as the, the vice chancellor of CUHK, and he comes from, again, the whole family very um, oriented towards US higher education from before 1949. Um, and it's a large family, I forget now, maybe 11 or 12 children. Um, all of the sons go to Berkeley or other US universities, mostly Berkeley, and eventually become US citizens and settle in the United States. And all of the, the daughters in the family go to higher education, many become university professors, um, secondary school principals, other esteemed positions, but all remain in the PRC, um, in part because they didn't have those educational opportunities, um, connections, sense of the ease of going abroad. And so it's a very stark gendered dynamic, at least within that particular family, um, as to how this plays out and who is positioned for opportunities. Um, and the result is that then in in the later chapters when we do finally begin to have people like Marjorie Yang, whose father chose her um, you know, and, and empowered her uh, in that sense. It's s surprising, it's startling at that point, you know, because it's just so um, so ingrained by that point, or I think, or at least for me as, as the writer of it. Great, thanks. Uh, a question from my, my colleague here in the society, Dylan Shaw. Uh, he says that this is this has been a great talk and that he's very happy as a non-specialist who has had to teach on Hong Kong that a book like this has, has finally been written, that it's a long time coming. He says that he's curious as to what role the turmoil of the 1960s and subsequent shifts in colonial policy play in the story you're telling. So things like the Cultural Revolution era riots and uh, the, the Bonn campaign and so forth. Um. It's a great question. I, uh, I think for most of the people that I'm um, focused on here, the stability while un instability while unnerving um, was in that sense a repeat of similar things that had already happened. Most exam particularly the outbreak of the Korean War sent many people running from Hong Kong at that time and the particularly uh, this came up in the the Chung Chi College papers. Um, I guess a lot of the faculty ditched um, and they, it took them some time to reconstitute operations and the, the backers, the Lingnan trustees and the United Board in New York are scrambling, trying to figure out what's happening, how serious is this? Um, and that in the mentality of always assuming that the PRC would eventually invade or otherwise that Hong Kong would come to an end, it confirmed, I think, what you know, the, the, what they suspected would always be the case. Um, uh, in that, you needed to have um, other options. Um, but that said, I think it's it's really interesting. Many of them also commented on the in, the nineteen sixties instability in the U.S. And many of them, I think, very relevant for now, were quite dismayed by what they saw in the U.S. in the nineteen sixties and kind of. Uh, kind of conversations around too much freedom, too much democracy, um, the kind of uh, kind of getting out of hand there as well, and that the um, their um, liberally minded pe minded people in the broadest classical sense of that, but not necessarily um, uh, <laughs> overly democratic in their their sympathies or um, their ideals of what society should look like. Yeah, maybe actually on that, I was very interested in, in that point that you make in the book when you talk about Tiananmen and you talk about um, earlier experiences. You say these are sort of almost apolitical actors or that they're more interested in the social and economic aspect of what going to study in the United States, having these connections to the United States are. What do you think the political aspect is for them, though? What do you th think, if you, if you can generalise, um, what kind of political actors 
does this make them when they come back to Hong Kong or when they become so influential in Hong Kong? I wouldn't describe them as apolitical, I describe them as pragmatic. Um, and that I think in part that is why they got on so well with Deng Xiaoping, because I think that that is a, a very useful word for Deng Xiaoping as well, um, in that they, they liked things that worked um, and uh, that um, uh, were seen as good for business, good for stability, good for um, kind of long-term possibilities uh, from this base of Hong Kong. Um, but I think that they're, if, to be more critical of, of this group, which is a diverse group of people, um, you know, what unites them is trans-Pacific movement more than any identity or politics, um, but that um, to be more critical or um, uh, skeptical of their statements and their, their, their actions, I think it's always super important to remember that this, by and large, this whole group of people were naturalized as US citizens, um, you know, and, and that one way or the other, and other options as well, they had a place to go. Um, and that thus in any political calculations, most especially the handover Tiananmen 1997, um, their position, their opinions always had that insurance policy underneath them um, and that they could afford to prioritize short-term profits um, stability now um, versus what they perceived as democratic idealism, um, because in the end, they had already achieved democratic ideals, at least for their own children, who would go on to live in San Francisco, New York, London, Sydney, whatever. Um, and so there, there's always that kind of um, thing that I don't think is talked enough about of, of the passport that is in the drawer or often multiple passports that are in the drawer um, that is kind of a constant subtext in, in these peoples and in Hong Kong more broadly um, as to people's options and that not everyone has the same options. Uh, so two questions from Koji Hirata. He says that it's been a, a very interesting talk and he's looking forward to, to reading the book, but he has two questions that sort of build on some of the comments by the commentators. Building on John Moore's comments, he asked how the British colonial authorities viewed the growing American presence in Hong Kong. Did they welcome Americans as their allies and brothers in the Cold War? Or did they feel uncomfortable about the US influence? And then second, building on Professor Sin's comments, he asked what, how and whether different regional and cultural backgrounds within the Chinese elites in Hong Kong mattered. Many Hong Kong Chinese moved there from the mainland, especially Shanghai, but not exclusively Shanghai. And even Shanghainese people ha had different regional local backgrounds themselves, local Wuxi, Ningbo, et cetera. And uh, Koji would like to know how this interacted, how they interacted, how these, these uh, those displaced from the mainland interacted with Cantonese speaking elites in, in Hong Kong. Did they retain distinct regional cultural identities or did they merge into the local Cantonese people speaking? Uh, mm. Sorry, Cantonese speaking people um, smoothly. Also, both great questions. Um, the, but the first, with how did the British colonials thought about this, reacted to all this? It really depends on the sector that we're talking about. Um, and then in kind of chapter two, I focus on primary schools, community centers, vocational education programs. And there, I think that um, by and large, the British colonial regime was glad for this US presence. It, it, it helped them to cover up just how under-resourced and exposed and woefully behind on things like social services they were. And that often it, it, it's a, I think it leads to a really great outcome because the British colonial administrators are far more informed about Hong Kong's needs, particular districts, who lives in that district and what the people in that district might want. Um, and often are, you know, kind of micromanaging the American project in useful ways as saying, you know, that's, that's really bad floor covering for a recreation room. You should use this, you know, really microscopic detail of British colonial involvement there that I think by and large leads to a better outcome um, in, in how this money is spent and applied. Um, in higher education, however, it really is quite a different story. Um, my sense is that the British colonial officials by and large perceived higher education as one proud legacy 
of the British Empire and the emerging Commonwealth that they hoped would be a key link between the, 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 all the territories of the former British Empire um, and kind of put a positive spin on British imperialism as higher educational opportunity. And that thus this turf, you know, at the, we're, we're hosting here at HKU, um, particularly at first really threatened HKU's, you know, um, positions. And, and there are um, a number of British and Australian um, senior officials of HKU at that time who are, you know, to use a loaded word, but are, who are quite racist about, you know, kind of their opinion of Chinese, high, Chinese language higher education um, and feel very threatened by the refugee colleges and this American stuff that's going on. Um, but in particular, particularly because of the US missionary colleges in China before 1949, you just have a very large group of people who are more used to working with American academic systems and that's what they start to replicate a good example being Lingnan and, and the many faculty and administrators of Lingnan who came to Hong Kong. Um, the different regional and dialectical differences, uh, Elizabeth might be you know, even better positioned to, to illuminate this than I. Um, you know, there are definitely tensions between particularly the Shanghainese and Cantonese and senses of, of superiority going on um, back and forth. And that many families, again, the Tang family is a useful example, never learned to speak Cantonese and deliberately so, um, you know, and kind of communicated with their own Cantonese speaking workers through intermediaries um, and simultaneously in kind of context to our, our days today, also chose deliberately never to learn Mandarin. When Jack Tang goes to meet Deng Xiaoping, he requires a translator in order to, to conduct the meeting with Deng Xiaoping. Um, you know, and so that kind of conducted that kind of individual conducted their whole life in Shanghainese and English, um, depending on, on the contexts. Um, but that said, they and Li Chouming, who is Cantonese, the Tangs and the Li Chouming work very well together, you know, and be part, I argue, because they share this larger educational vision of where Hong Kong education and Hong Kong more broadly needs to go. Um, and so the Tangs are very active donors for these projects. And Tang Pingyuan, the, the patriarch of that family, kind of mentors Li Chouming in a certain sense. And Li Chouming ends up being a pallbearer at his funeral. Um, so it, you know, there are both tensions and personal relationships that transcend that, I think, those, those dialectical and regional differences. So we still have time for maybe a couple more questions if uh, any other audience members have any questions. Although I thought I'd also give any of the commentators a chance to um, chime back in if they had any questions of their own, any thoughts that arose from the discussion. Um, you know, do, do come in now if, if you'd like to. Either of the Johns or uh, Johns or uh, uh, Elizabeth would like, would either of you, any of you like to say anything? If I can just chime in quickly, um, I think Peter, you rightfully. I do have a quick question. It's John John Carroll. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Oh, uh, maybe John uh, Carroll first, it's, it's... And, then, and then John Wong. Great. Sorry, John. Thanks, thanks, Pete, uh, and thank you, Peter. Um, I did have the question that I that I sort of threw out earlier. Um, I wonder when you were doing your research when you told some of these people that you had come up with a new term for them, Kwa Shang. What did what did they think about that? I basically didn't mention it, um, in part because <laughs> the, interviews, the interviews took took some time, and kind of the crystallization of thinking about it as you know the term and strategies uh, came later in 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 the, the whole process of research and writing. Um, but mostly, what I uh, found that was quite surprising to me was you know a lot of the richest quotes I think in the project come not from my personal interviews with them or, or other conversations, but very public oral histories that, that were conducted by the Hong Kong Heritage Project or, or the, the Regional Oral History Office at UC Berkeley and are in the Bancroft Library of um, really quite shocking things that um, you know, I wouldn't have advised them to say. And that I think um, it, you know, kind of goes to both a certain, um, for lack of a better word, perhaps sense of entitlement about that, that 
our perspective is right and you know kind of you know uh, worth listening to, um, but also refreshing um, in, in that uh, they're particularly now mostly living in California and, and other places uh, feel fully. Uh, able to um, dish, <laughs> if you will, on on the Hong Kong colonial government, fellow Hong Kong elites, the Chinese government, etc. Um, uh, so I don't think my my guess is actually that most of them wouldn't mind or would actually be quite flattered um, in the sense of that people are writing histories about them because they probably think history should be written about them. <laughs> I've I've met some of the same people too, and I've always been. I don't know if it's impressed or shocked by how willing they are to tell people how far they would go to get ahead, not just for them, but for their families and so on. It's uh, um, sometimes legal, sometimes not, sometimes in this sort of gray area of informality that you discuss. Uh, but again, no, uh, no punches pulled often. Yes, and, and um, you know, I forget where I talk about the book, but you know, there is a certain shameless elitism that, that is going on here and that I hope is jarring for the reader when you encounter it, um, you know, be, uh, that helps to illuminate the larger psyche of many of these actors, you know, and why they're doing the things that they're doing. But, you know, in the sense of elite networks and business strategy and such like that, you know, uh, the Tangs also say at some point, one of them of, of um, well, in Hong Kong, you would never hang out with anyone, but fellow elites, you know, um, and kind of, so of course we knew all of those people um, and, and, you know, and it's just very kind of explicit, as you said. John Wong, you also had uh, a question. Uh, I think uh, just based on some of the questions that, that you have received, uh, Peter, you rightfully highlighted the US involvement um, in structuring this global network in the Cold War at the site of Hong Kong. Uh, but based on the number of questions that you received on the role of the UK, I wonder if um, you can write another book. I mean, th th would this have been possible without the lubricating effect of this waning power through Hong Kong, at the base of Hong Kong? Perhaps you can even write another book on that and uh, start another project um, on, on, on that topic. But I, I just feel that um, some of this would not have been possible um, without the British. Uh, and maybe I should... I should, I should qualify the statement. Uh, without the British of that vintage, Meckley Holtz was quite a different governor compared to Chris Patton, and not just because of the personalities, but also because of the uh, situation they had to deal with. So I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, thought that, uh, because that's not something that we have in the contemporary situation, and I wonder how that changed the dynamics. Absolutely, there, it would not have been possible um, at least a lot of this would not have been possible without that key context. And unfortunately for word count reasons, you know, that, that <laughs> got marginalized. Um, but Next book. There, there's this complex calculation going on about um, stabil the stability of the, of the British colonial government, genu genuine concern for the residents of Hong Kong and what's in their best interest in terms of educational opportunities, social services, et cetera. Um, and also another kind of certain pragmatism about, well, you know, we don't always love the Americans, but better them than you know, necessarily a whole bunch of other actors kind of coming in and, you know, <clears throat> involved in things. Um, Could I just say like that, something yeah. about the British system um, until 1997? I mean, there are certain built-in um, uh, ties to Britain that couldn't be over... Um, taken by the Americans. One is, of course, the, the law system and the uh, medical system. The qualifications are very, very important. I mean, you, you, you want to practice law, you want to practice uh, medicine in Hong Kong, you just have to have those qualifications. You have to get them in the UK. Um, you have to get, um, um, you, you couldn't have American doctors practicing in Hong Kong unless you were for, you know, you worked in the Adventist Hospital or something. So it, those are areas that are very well protected yes. um, by the British system. And of course, the and the schools, um, the overseas uh, allowances that were given to um, civil servants' children for the longest time were only could only be used in British schools. So all the kids went to boarding school in England and then you know, university from, from there. So those, those ties were very structured and very well, I mean, they were very uh, embedded 
Yes, that's such a good point. And, and it, I, um, I think it's with Chongqi College in chapter three, there, where that becomes most explicit when they decide to pursue business education. Because they're looking for, in essence, a fee generating graduate program to start and say explicitly, we shouldn't do it in medicine or law because you know it's too British. Our graduates won't do the things we hope that our graduates will be able to do, and the U.S. backers won't pay for it, you know. And so instead, they end up choosing business education as this open space where an American-oriented and paid-for program um, can get going, uh, yeah. you know. And you can kind of see right there, you know, the kind of these systems and the logics of people right, working right. that out at the yeah. time. And certain spheres are very bound up and it's very hard to break into. Yes. Yes. Architecture and engineering is another one um, that was similarly regulated, um, much more difficult. All right. Uh, well, if we don't have, oh, there is a there is a final final question from uh, the UK. Uh, they say a very informative and nice talk. Um, in another event, Peter, you talked about management education in China and its links with MIT, which I think is, is your second project or maybe connected to your second project, depending on Joe Tal Moore's uh, previous question. <laughs> and I think <laughs> the, the question that asks, uh, do you say, says that Peter himself can be rightly called a qua scholar. And <laughs> he, and the, the question asker wants to ask how the Shanghainese business people who didn't have this American connection were, did in Hong Kong. How did they interact with this qua Shang group? Was there more convergence or divergence among these uh, these groups, those that didn't didn't have that connection. Both both excellent questions. The um, and I realized I forgot to answer a previous question about second project. And indeed, it, it's actually Li Cho Ming's decision to establish an MBA program at CUHK, which is the first MBA program in East or Southeast Asia at this time that kind of cued me into again kind of the similar dynamic that Elizabeth and I were just discussing. <laughs> you know, management education as a topic worth exploring, most especially just because when Li Chongming tells the British colonial government that he's the education officials that he's going to start this program, they don't know what an MBA program is at this, you know, and there's all this confusion where they're like, do you mean a PhD in, in economics? You know, and it's like, no, 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 it's a, it's a totally different thing. Um, but it particularly revealing because then they get back to him and say, well, you, there are no MBA programs in the United Kingdom and legally we simply cannot confer degrees in a colony that are not, don't exist in the United Kingdom. You know, it's not a real degree to our perspective. Um, and so there's all this tussling. And again, he, he turns to the Lingnan trustees in New York to, to establish this, this program in 1966. Um, but yes, management as is a very fascinating lens in my opinion, um, because it's a, bundled of other business ideologies through education. You know, and another example there is accounting um, and that the MBA program serves as in essence kind of a Trojan horse for American accounting systems to enter Hong Kong. And kind of which, which kind of accounting are you going to train students in? Um, and Li Chiming is quite adamant that they will be American accounting so that they can become, you know, work in multi US multinational corporations that use American accounting. So there's, you know, education as this kind of training and, and interesting lens into all these other colliding systems. Um, I'm sorry, I blanked on the second So the, the, the question, the second part of the question perhaps was on the relationships between Shanghainese people who didn't, or, or other characters in the book, who didn't have the, the Kua Shang connection, and, and, but were still in this elite uh, milieu. Um, how did they interact with those that did? One, ex one uh, interesting, I think, example there that we talk about in the book um, is H.J. Shen there, the banker, um, in that he, he, as someone who's reconstituting his career, is trading his own social capital as part of his business strategy, and that for fellow industrialists most especially, that's really how he becomes this key broker between the industrialist group and the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, is that many of these industrialists, less elite ones than say the Tangs, don't have these kinds of connections. But he knows all of them already and is, can act as a go-between and a facilitator of all sorts of other connections. Um, and that, particularly in that point, uh, his like basically lifelong best friend and he, Fr Francis Pan, who was in the, the presentation and the photos, 
came to Hong Kong together. Um, and Francis Pan is very much in league with the US government and various Pan. So there's all kinds of influence training that's going on, particularly for those who say didn't have those contacts, didn't have that um, kind of access. They could acquire it through the network of fellow, say, Shanghainese industrialists, um, kind of dinner, you know, H. H. Shen talks about how his key business strategy was dinner parties, um, you know, and introducing people to the right other people that they wanted to be introduced to. Great, great. Um, okay, so unless there are any final questions, just maybe a couple of things for me to say at the end. First and foremost, a, a big thank you to all of our speakers and to the three commentators for taking the time to read and then share their thoughts, but in particular to Peter for writing and then uh, sharing his thoughts uh, today. I, I really would recommend the book and it's been uh, a privilege to, to hear about it today, but also to read about it in preparation. And then finally, a little bit of promotion for the Society of Fellows. We have future events that are listed on our website, which is www.sofhku.com. And at the moment, we're also recruiting our next cohort of postdoctoral fellows. The deadline for that is the 1st of next month, the 1st of February, so it's a pretty close. Um, but if you're interested, then do take a look at the website um, and do send us an application. But uh, I'll maybe leave it there and just thank again all, all our speakers and thank all of the audience members for, for logging in and sharing their questions. Um, so thanks to everybody. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Pete, and thank you all for coming. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Peter. Bye. Thank you, John. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Hi, Peter. Bye. <laughs>